Okay, Matt is here. Sorry right. for the technical problems, but I would I lie to any of you? I said Matt would be here. I told you Matt would be here. Matt, yes. welcome. It's Bye. yeah, sorry about that. Sorry about that, everyone. Um yeah, just technical, couldn't get the password to work, couldn't find the password. <laughs> couple other things so yeah, well, we made, it. We it's, made it. it it's just one of those things you know where <laughs> we all live in the modern world and in the modern world we all have to deal with that everything is tech and tech doesn't always work and then things are a big pain in the butt but the important thing is that you're here and um we have a great audience tonight a lot of people from North Carolina and a lot of people from all around the United States. Yeah, I'm scrolling through the I'm scrolling through the attendance list and yeah, I see a lot of a lot of names, a lot of uh, uh, you know brings a smile to my face. So I, I appreciate everyone being here. I appreciate everyone uh, supporting us, getting us last th these three is two months. Uh, last time we did one of these was July 14th, which was the day that we dropped our lawsuit in federal court. So uh, for people who may not be familiar, we had to go to federal court to get onto the ballot, to get the North Carolina Green Party recognized as a party, get it certified because the State Board of Elections didn't want to do it. Even though we did everything correct, even though we, we, we turned in way more signatures than we needed, uh, really uh, the folks who did that for us, our ballot access team, you know, uh, the people of the North Carolina Green Party, the people on this campaign, all the independents who came out and helped us, like just totally killed it, just totally crushed it. That upset a lot of people. And so for the last two and a half months, we've been fighting both the state of North Carolina and the Democratic Party, not just the local North Carolina Democratic Party, but Chuck Schumer's outfit, the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee up in DC. So that was the last time we did one of these was uh, almost six weeks ago now. And we have spent the last six weeks fighting the North Carolina Green Party, this campaign, a bunch of other folks who've come and backed us up. We've had support all throughout North Carolina and from across the country, uh, even, even people chiming in from overseas. Uh, most of the folks who are chiming in for overseas were, were kind of aghast. They were like, this is what you guys are doing. This is what, you know, as one guy said it really clearly to me, he said, um, let me get this straight. In the United States, the two parties that are in power get to decide who their opposition is. And I said, yeah, that's right. That's what we're dealing with here. So uh, to bring everyone up to speed, we went to court. Uh, two great lawyers, uh, Oliver Hall and Puyan Ordabadi, just did absolutely phenomenal work. They defeated the high price, uh, not just the high price uh, Democratic law firm, the Elias Law Group, uh, which is headed by uh, uh, John Kerry, Hillary Clinton's, uh, Kamala Harris's attorney, Mark Elias, but they defeated the North Carolina Department of Justice as well. Just our, our two guys, Puyan and, and Oliver, took on uh, Leviathan and they won in court uh, roundly. I mean, if, if people haven't read the district court's order in our favor, I mean, it just, it, it, Judge Deaver just slams uh, both the Democratic Party and the State Board of Elections for, um, you know, committing fraud themselves, basically, for doing everything they could to keep us unfairly and unjustly off the ballot for trying to deny uh, voters options at the ballot. So, uh, you know, we, we've gone through all that. A uh, federal appeals court ruled in our favor as well. Uh, and so now there are a couple of lawsuits still outstanding. Uh, there is that uh, appeals court uh, uh, case that the, the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee uh, is pursuing, um, as well as the North Carolina Democratic Party has a lawsuit in state court to try and uh, undo uh, our certification and are being placed on the ballot. Michael Trudeau and mine is being placed on the ballot. Um, but we don't think those will have any effect on this election. But the concern is, of course, that those uh cases will continue on because they're not going to give up. They're not going to stop until they have 
got the North Carolina Green Party off the ballot. And that's something, of course, we're going to fight against for as long as we have to, uh, because, uh, you know, it's not just the right thing to do, uh, but it's also um, the just thing to do. Uh, way too many of you put too much work into this for us just to say, oh, OK, you're a big law firm in D.C. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You're the attorney general. Oh, and the governor's pissed off about this, too. Oh, hang on. Oh, so we're sorry we overstepped. We're, we're sorry that we want to come in here and talk about health care and housing and jobs and education, that we want to talk about the war on drugs, that we want to talk about real action on the climate. Uh, I'm sorry that upsets you and you all had to go to such great undemocratic lengths to try and keep us off the ballot. So so here we are six weeks after we filed that federal lawsuit. Last time we did one of these good news. Uh, again, I'm so grateful for everything everyone's done to support us, all the work that's been done, all the support given, all the donations, all the just the, the kind emails and text messages and Facebook messages supporting us, you know, and so now we are really excited to uh, begin our campaign because we have for the last two and a half months been tied up with this. And the previous four months were spent getting signatures, getting people to put pen to paper, you know, to get us on the ballot. So here we are now looking forward. We've got about 11 weeks before the election and we are really excited to do what we set out to do, represent people who are otherwise not gonna be represented, talk about issues that are otherwise gonna be ignored and disrupt the status quo. And uh, Rose, I wanna turn it back to you for a second. Yes, and well, I just wanted to to answer Margaret Elizabeth's question. Um, damages is something that is going to be pursued. Uh, but I will say this, we are a little behind on running a campaign to put Matthew Ho in the US Senate. So for, from my perspective, I had to remember, oh, aren't I a campaign manager <laughs> and, campaign and, and, and we have to run one? And it's starting to really, uh, and I, you know, the impact of having to deal with this, it has left us behind on some things. So that really has to be the focus, but, but yes, uh, things will be pursued for sure. And, um, you know, they weren't just scared of, Matt Ho being on the ballot. They were scared of grassroots democracy. Uh, all the people here today, like Gail, like Janie, uh, so many people here today who have been um, out in the streets petitioning their butts off, worked so hard to make this happen. That's who they're scared of more than anyone. And what I, uh, my motto for the rest of this campaign is, well, they were scared to have Matt on the ballot. Now let's give them something to be scared of. Okay, so I can't hear you, but I know you are all cheering out there. Now, without further ado, I'm going to quickly introduce a man who does not need introduction because you all know him, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Matthew Ho, is the 2022 North Carolina Green Party candidate for U.S. Senate. In 2009, Matt resigned in protest from his post in Afghanistan with the State Department over the American escalation of the war. In 2010, Matt was named the Ridenauer Prize recipient for truth telling. Imagine a U.S. Senator who has been celebrated for truth telling. Uh, that would be a strange and wonderful thing indeed, wouldn't it? Matt's writing have, writings have appeared online and in print periodicals such as the Huffington Post, USA Today, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. He's been a guest on hundreds of news programs and radio and television networks, including CBS, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, NPR, the BBC, and PBS. And without further ado, let's give it up for Matt Ho, who is going to be talking about the Inflation Reduction Act. Matt. Hey, thanks, Rose. And uh, thanks again for everyone uh, being here, supporting us. Uh, you know, and I look forward to doing the next 11 weeks with you all. Um, you know, one of the things uh, I, I think that we want to talk about was the Inflation Reduction Act. But there's a lot of other things we can talk about, too. Um, and I'll try and keep my comments uh, brief. Uh, but uh, anyone who knows me knows that that's probably not going to be 
uh, possible. Uh, you know, if anyone's ever <laughs> held me to heard me talk, you know that it, it, nothing ever, no, no, nothing ever concise comes out of out of this mouth. Um, but uh, you know, one, but one of the things I think is just the uh, um, the continued like fraud, the continued um, lip service, uh, the hypocrisy that those in power uh, just unleash, just have no. Uh, no no fear no no shame and just saying things that are not true just 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 pushing snake oil right and telling people that this is going to be the solution to their problems uh, i mean the inflation reduction act is, is i think a, 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 a prime example uh, you know a, a top tier example of that but certainly we can go and we can look at uh what the the, the great that great bipartisan success a couple months ago uh, supposedly about guns which we all know is going to do uh, uh, almost uh, nothing uh, about gun violence in this country uh you know we can go and we can look at um abortion and, and the democrats saying that they are going to do something about abortion that they're going to protect uh women's health care uh that they're going to protect the right to choose but we know they're not going to do it they did they, they were they were going to do it they would have done it at some point over the last 50 years and actually i did see in the comments there that uh uh uh, Vicky Ryder, uh, my good friend uh, Vicky, asked me what my coffee mug says, and uh, this is a holdover mug uh, from my ex. And uh, you know, it, it says, "And my mom, my mom hates this mug, so I'll tell her to mute it and turn off the 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 the, the camera." But uh, you know, the cup set the cup uh, clearly says, "Y'all can read that there." You know, f your patriotic, f your patriarchal uh, BS, right? You know, because um, that's what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with uh, a system, uh, an establishment, um, a power structure that is, uh, you yeah, of course, a patriarchy, it's an oligarchy, it's white supremacy, it's all those things that have uh, uh, su been successful in the centuries that have come before in ensuring power remaining at the top. Um, and, you know, so we see that when we hear these things about how uh, all you got to do is, is vote harder, all you got to do is just keep doing the same thing you did before, but this time we're going to protect abortion. This time we're going to do something about health care. You know, this time we're going to do something about guns. And, you know, obviously uh, they don't because we see the situation, the circumstances, the condition of so many of our neighbors or so many of our friends, so many of our family continuing to deteriorate. You know, and the Inflation Reduction Act is, is a really, again, prime example of that. You know, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, uh, you know, it, it's not just uh, pundits or, or people like Bernie Sanders saying it doesn't reduce inflation. It's actually, if you look at any of the budget agencies out there, the, the people that score these kinds of things, they say it doesn't do anything about inflation. Statistically, zero is what they say it will do in terms of affecting inflation, but it sounds good. And it's just nothing but a marketing scheme in order to try and get votes for the midterm, even though uh, it does nothing to help people. Uh, even even though some sectors of our economy, some some workers uh, so in some industries have seen pay raises, overall, uh, ac you know, across the board, pay is dropping dramatically. Real pay is dropping dramatically for families because inflation is running at about eight and a half percent. And what they'll say, of course, is and what they do say is that, well, this is because of, uh, you know, a six, a fourteen hundred dollar check you received 18 months ago, which is completely absurd and completely ignores the trillion dollars that was given uh, through the Paycheck Protection Program, which, you know, again, similarly to like to the, 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 the uh, uh, student loan cancellation, the partial student loan cancellation. And we'll see, I, I would say about that. Let's wait and see what happens. Let's revisit that in two or three or four years and find out how many people actually had that $10,000 forgiven. Because I know a number of years ago, the federal government said it was going to do that for people working in public service who are working, you know, in the federal government, who are working in, in, in various professions, that they would have their student loan eliminated uh, over time as they put years into public service. And 99% of them never saw that. So I would say with this, this student loan cancellation, which is hardly near enough of what needs to be done it's something but it's not nearly enough of what needs to be done let's let's revisit that in three or four years and find out how many people actually qualified for it but you know this this pattern of of using uh really uh 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 uh, uh, uh 
convincing sounding, consequential, consequential sounding, uh, uh, results oriented type language, just all marketing. And, 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 you know, this Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the aspects of it, uh, you know, with regards to health care, say the Medicare benefits, uh, it will cap bene- it will cap out of pocket costs for seniors. It doesn't take effect for four years. So what occurs between now and four years from now, we'll see. But it will cap out of pocket costs and it will also allow uh, the federal government to negotiate prices. On a total of 10 drugs, out of thousands of drugs out there, they can negotiate on 10, and that doesn't take place until 2026 as well. Meanwhile, nothing changes for the tens and tens of millions of Americans who are just paying so much, paying 10, 20, 30% of their incomes towards health care. You know, and we, we, we know this, right? We know that we have a system where if you survive cancer, half of you, half of those who survive cancer end up going bankrupt because that's the way our system is. It's a for-profit system. Before the uh, pandemic, tens of thousands of people were dying every year because of our for-profit healthcare system. And during the pandemic, we know that one in three COVID deaths are tied to a lack of healthcare. Again, because of for-profit healthcare. So for-profit healthcare killed 330,000 people in the, in the pandemic, right? I mean, so we see all, all this. And so what the need was simply just not met at all. And what could have been done, you know, the, the subsidies that could have occurred for working families in an act like this just were ignored. Bernie Sanders tried to do th- some things, but he didn't, he didn't hold up the bill. He didn't do what Mansion and Cinema have done in terms of, of making sure nothing was going forward unless the oil and gas companies got what they wanted, like Joe Manchin wanted, and, and, and the uh, hedge fund managers and, and the wealthy got their tax breaks like Kirsten Cinema wanted. You know, and so you see that. You see again this hypocrisy, this idea that this is a uh, this is a great thing for working families when the chief beneficiaries by far are the wealthy, are Wall Street, are corporations. I mean, there's some good things in there, but it's at the minimum. It's the bare minimum of what could have been done. And the benefits to the corporations far exceed, far exceed any of the corporate taxes that are being raised, supposedly being raised. So, I mean, again, it's all this marketing. It's all this. This is why we're in this. This is why we do this kind of thing. This is why we're running as Greens, right? This is why we're supporting campaigns like this one, like Delia Barrios in Texas, like Justin Paglino up in Connecticut, like uh, uh, Robin Harris down in Florida. This is why we're doing these things, because if we don't provide some type of alternative that's actually going to do something for working families, try and make it so that working families have the same benefits that corporations, banks, and the wealthy have had for decades, you know, we're going to continue to see things deteriorate. People are continuing to suffer. People are going to fall farther behind. You know, we, we've passed the point now where more than 60,000, more, more, more than 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Half of Americans who are making more than $100,000 a year are living paycheck to paycheck. You know, I've talked about this before, right? You know, this idea that for decades, really since the Nixon administration, everything has been done to squeeze the money from the bottom to the top. And the working class has been squeezed dry. And so now the middle class are the ones being squeezed. You know, and, and, and so we see this in, in things like this Inflation Reduction Act, the continuation of those policies. That these are the things that we oppose. This is why we're running. This is what we're trying to change. And then, of course, the most egregious aspects of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, that this is some kind of climate bill, when I believe, as does, say, the Center for Biological Diversity does, that this is a climate suicide pact, that what we are doing here in terms of the expansion of oil and gas far outweighs any of the climate provisions that are included in this, and while there are some great things in it, you know, in a sense of uh, uh, you know so, so, some some different things that will move forward, uh, clean and renewable energy, it is a pittance. It is a pittance. First of all, the overall budget for it is four percent of what we spend on the Pentagon every year. So this is going to be about a thirty-seven billion dollar year climate bill, and we spend eight hundred and forty billion dollars a year on the Pentagon. Uh, you know, and that doesn't include the CIA, and that doesn't include the FBI, and that doesn't include the Veterans Administration, and that doesn't include nuclear weapons and all those things. Just the, just the Pentagon itself, 4%. Meanwhile, we are facing 
just an onslaught of climate co- of a com- climate collapse that is coming harder and faster than anyone ever predicted. So you know, one of the things that we see in this uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, that is so dangerous is the giveaways to the oil and gas industry. You know, this is what Manchin and Schumer in their literal backroom deal, because suppose it was just the two of them who put this together, and both of them have received, in Schumer's case, hundreds of thousands of dollars from the oil and gas industry in the last year or two. And meanwhile, Manchin has taken in millions. And Manchin, by the way, remember, remember, he owns two coal companies, not one, but two. So, you know, what we see here is we see is we see this this giveaway, you know, a, a, that forms the basis of this idea that this is a suicide pact, right? That, you know, this uh, requirement that for any of the solar and wind projects that this, um, that this uh, uh, bill purports to put into uh, 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 progress, right? That, that it claims will, it will advance over the next 10 years. For anything that it purports to do, the oil and gas industry must receive their share. And by their share, it means that they will receive at least 2 million acres of public land every year. That's the size of Yellowstone. So people get, get an idea of how many, how many acres 2 million acres is. That's the size of Yellowstone. And for uh, 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 comparison, it's about 1 million acres of land every year that the oil and gas industry receives from the federal government. So it's a doubling of the land. But offshore, on our waters, in our oceans, 60 million acres of that of, of water is going to be given to the oil and gas industry every year for the next 10 years. When you put that all together, that's 620 million acres of land and water going to the oil and gas industry. Again, to put that in perspective, Texas is 170 million acres, right? And we're giving to the oil and gas industry in the next 10 years, 620 million acres. And let's all take a step back and remember that every agency, every organization, every scientist out there that's worth a damn is saying, we have to stop fossil fuel use now. We have to begin ending it now. And what we're doing here is we are doubling at least the amount of oil and gas uh, leases available. And when, you, when they do the math and they break it out, what's that mean? That means in the next 10 years, the United States will export 50% more oil. And in the next 10 years, the United States will export 160% more gas. You know, and, and you look at this and you say, how, does, how do they then say this is gonna cut emissions? Well, because all the studies they cite that say it's gonna cut emissions don't include this fossil fuel expansion. The whole thing is rigged. The whole thing is crooked. And in 10, 20, 30 years, when we look back at this and we say, my God, what did we do? We will all agree. This was a suicide pact we went into. And I, I could be here all night going on about this. I mean, I didn't even get into the fact that like this, the, one of the side deals is that basically uh, the uh, oil and gas industry are going to have the regulations greatly reduced in terms of pipeline expansion. Uh, you know, the, 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 the carbon capture uh, fantasy is heavily populated throughout this, this idea that somehow Exxon and BP and Chevron are going to build these carbon capture facilities, which have never worked anywhere. Uh, and that somehow this is going to come save us. So we got to make sure the corporations that have done this to us are the ones that profit. You know, and then at the pipelines, uh, one of the things about the carbon capture is that it requires about 60 million uh, uh, more miles of pipeline in order to do the carbon capture they want to do. And that's, of course, you're talking about a lot of methane possibly being released. I mean, the danger in this is just amazing. But for any of us who've been part of the environmental movement, people who are like I was out at Standing Rock, you know, who people who have been part of it here in North Carolina fighting the Mountain Valley pipeline, you know, fighting the colonial pipeline, uh, you know, this is a knife in the heart. It, it really is. And what the Democrats have done here by claiming that this is a bill that will save us is it's ensuring our doom. While we cheer, we are, we are going under. Uh, and the real danger to me, and after, I know this will be my last comment, the real danger to me is that just like we had happen in 2010 with Obamacare, with the ACA, what they're going to say 
is, oh, we did climb it. Climate change is fixed. We did the IRA back in 2022. We don't need to do anything more. We're good up until they, they tell us it's going to reduce uh, emissions by 40 percent by 2030. Has anyone checked on that? No, no, don't. That's inconvenient. Don't do that. But that's the real danger here is that they're going to use this. They're going to take this and they're going to say, we've already done climate. We don't have to worry about it any longer. Just like with student loans, the same thing, too. We don't have to do anything about that anymore. We've already done that. It's all taken care of. And they will try and get away with it. And it's our rule not to let them get away with it. And, uh, you know, that's why we're all here. That's why we're all in this, in this, in this, uh, these circumstances together, trying to disrupt the status quo because we see what the status quo does. It's deadly. It, it, it's so beneficial for a few, but it's so deadly for the rest of us. And that's, that's what we're trying to, to tear down. So, uh, Rose, I'll, I'll send it back over to you, but thank you so much, y'all. Thank you, Matt. So uh, now it's time for some question and answer. So let's look at some of the questions we have here. Matt, uh, this is from Dave Mullenix. Uh, he asked if you could talk about part two of the Inflation Reduction Act the bill that will fast track fossil fuel project permit. Yeah, thank, yeah thanks. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, so this, I, I briefly touched on it. And the idea is that the regulations that are in place now, which are often, as any of us who've been involved in any of this stuff know, uh, easily overlooked, easily bypassed, uh, easily ignored by the administrations. Uh, the Obama administration did it to a great degree. The Trump administration really did it, you know, in a sense of uh, every time you'd say you build a pipeline, you do something like that, you need to do uh, an environmental impact study. And that environmental impact study is supposed to look and see what are the what are the dangers, what are the risks, what are the consequences of something like this. And actually, in the last couple of years, the courts have said that it has to include the risk of, of further uh, exasperating climate change. And uh, what this side deal does is not actually part of the IRA, but it is coming. It is it is uh, going to be tacked on to what, what everyone expects to see it tacked on to is the uh, is the uh, continuous resolution. So you know how uh, every year the federal government, because the, the Congress can't can't get a budget done for a lot of their agencies, they pass a continuous resolution, which just extends the budget from previous years. You know, so that's what they'll they'll, they'll do is they'll attach this onto the Democrats, uh, Schumer, Mansion. Pelosi, Hoyer, et cetera, will attach this bill, uh, fast tracking uh, pipelines. Uh, uh, so by what I mean by fast tracking, I mean you're cutting the regulations, you're making it a lot easier for uh, the oil and gas companies to build these things, which makes it much more profitable for the banks to invest in. And it completely cuts the legs out from the environmental groups, as well as all those frontline communities, which, you know, more than, more than not, are typically our, 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 you know, our indigenous brothers and sisters and our black and brown brothers and sisters because they're where they run the pipelines through. You know, you don't see too many, you, again, I'll reference Standing Rock. You look at where the pipeline went, it didn't go through the white parts of North Dakota, it went through the indigenous parts. You know, I mean, that's not an accident. Uh, so the fast tracking of all that will be tacked onto uh, the continuous resolution which then puts any Democrats that want to oppose this uh, in a bind because will they then not go along with this and shut the government down? Now, we know what the Republicans would do in a situation like this. The Republicans would shut the government down. And for us awful and as heinous and as terrible and just, uh, 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 you know, about that the Republicans are, they are effective at getting things done. And what they're doing here, we're wondering now is if, Will any of the progressive champions that we have or supposed champions in Congress, i.e. the squad or Bernie Sanders, make the government shut down rather than see these, these uh, uh, environmental regulations curtailed, right? Will, we sh will, they, will, will AOC and Ilan Omar and Jamal Bowman and uh, all these and these others, will they actually do something for once? and shut the government down rather than seeing the oil and gas companies 
have the opportunity to basically bulldoze, literally bulldoze over any and all environmental protections that have been put in place to try and not just, again, it's not about climate, but this is about protecting our land or water or air, you know? So um, this is something that we all need to uh, uh, be aware of and uh, be looking for and uh, really be trying to encourage those progressive members of Congress to block this. I don't think they will because they've not done anything like this since they've been in office, but this is a real danger. And this again is why uh, this notion that the IRA is a climate suicide pact is not hyperbole. Thank you, Matt. I have a question here from Sam Coleman. It's it's somewhat more of a statement than a question, but I, I think it's something that you're going to be asked to address this a lot, and I want you to address it here. The Dems want to paint you as a spoiler, but you could be inspiring a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise vote, period, plus Republicans who hunger for some honesty. I hope there are competent analysts who will see what you're bringing in there. And so just to add to that, uh, can you address the, the constant cries of spoiler and your role in this race as a genuine democratic choice for the people? Yeah, you know, I mean, um, the notion of spoiler implies that uh, one of the two parties is entitled to votes. Uh, and so if you're on the left and, um, you know, I think it's a name that we have this description of our political, situ of our political situation or political, um, excuse me, environment as just a, a linear horizontal line. I mean, that aids the two-party system because one one side of that two-party system can claim the whole left side of that of, of the line and the other side can claim the whole right. And so our, you know, if you're in a libertarian party or a constitution party or whatever, you get called out as a spoiler by the Republicans, just as the Democrats claim that the Green Party or PSL or Social Alternative or anyone else is being a spoiler. Um, again, it's this idea that there's entitlement, that you don't have to earn a vote that you're entitled to vote. You know, what, what that does is that means that you can just choose to ignore many issues. You can choose to ignore entire constituencies, right? You can choose to ignore um, the things that are problematic for your big donors. So when we get criticized for spoiling the elections, when we're told that you're gonna spoil the elections, people are not gonna vote for Sherry Beasley because they think Matt Ho is a better alternative. Well, you know, what they're talking about is you're talking about people who say, oh, look, here's someone who is advocating for me and my family. Here's someone who's advocating for my neighborhood, for my community. Here's someone who's advocating for working in, in, in middle class families. I mean, you saw it with the messaging that's come out of the Democratic Party about Joe Biden's uh, uh, student loan cancellation program. You know, the, the, the idea that's not nearly enough, that it's a pittance, that it, it's not going to solve the real problems that... Um, you know, and basically their attitude, and this has been their attitude for decades, you know, begins in the 70s, but really comes full swing under Clinton is the be happy with the crumbs that you're getting, because the other guys, the Republicans, aren't going to give you any crumbs at all. And the Republicans have a similar type of, of, of messaging, right, where they say, if you vote, if you let the Democrats take power, they're going to give your crumbs to people who don't deserve it. And in that sense, you know, insert insert who those people are, right? Brown, black, gay, indigenous, poor, you know, whoever, you know what I mean? But they, they have this message where they treat their constituencies as if they should be happy, they should be lucky for the crumbs they have. It's very, it's very uh, a Dickinsonian, right? You know, and, but that's, that's where we've gotten to. The, the, the decades of neoliberal uh, policies by both parties, pushing money to the top, squeezing money to the top, making sure everything benefits uh, the corporations, the banks, and the wealthy, and hey, look, push down wages, make working families, they can live off a of credit, you know, let's make the dollar strong so we can ship jobs overseas and buy factories overseas, and then, you know, Americans, they can buy cheap imports, and again, they don't have enough cash, we'll give them credit. And that system, as everyone knows, is collapsing, it's falling apart, we've reached the end of that, whatever bubble you want to talk about, housing, credit, you know, education, it's healthcare, they're, they're about to all burst. 
you know? So it's inconvenient for us to be on the ballot. It's hard for us to, it's difficult for the Democrats to have us on the ballot because we are addressing things that otherwise are not going to be addressed and that they certainly are not going to be addressed. This idea that somehow we shouldn't be on the ballot that again, it, it, during the pandemic, in, in a circumstance where one in four North Carolina North Carolinian adults are in collections for medical debt, not in medical debt, but in collections for medical debt, one in four. The um, idea that single payer health care, that Medicare for all, universal health care, whatever you want to call it, shouldn't be on the ballot. Like I, I should just be running on that issue alone. That in itself is enough of an issue to be on the ballot for let alone wages, right? Jobs, let alone housing. In North Carolina, uh, rent has gone up 30% in the last year. In this area, in the triangle, it's gone up close to 50% in the last year, 50%, all right? And there's no conversation from the Democrat or the Republican about rent control. There's no conversation about public banking to allow working families to be able to purchase a home. No, Certainly no conversation about making sure that corporations can't buy homes that families need. You mean like, so why aren't those issues on the ballot? Why can't those issues be there, be something that's available to voters, be an option to them? And we can go through the whole list, you know, the war on drugs itself, the mass incarceration piece, or the killing aspects of it. You know, in North Carolina, we have 12 opioid overdose deaths a day. That by itself is enough to be on the ballot. So, you know, this idea that somehow we're spoiling by providing other options, well, that's just a fear-based approach. That's just a, a, something that's effective in a two-party system. You know, uh, one thing that Andrew Yang has done, I know a lot of people have different views on Andrew and his forward party and, and what they're attempting to do. But one thing he's really done is really kind of brought in the, um, the absurdities and the inadequacies and the, the, the corruption of the two-party system. You know, in the United States, 70% of races are unopposed. And more than 90% of races, and this is from top to bottom, local all the way up to federal, and, 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 not, and more than 90% of races are not competitive. I mean, how can you call yourself a democracy when 70% of the races out there don't have more than one person in it? You know, I mean, so this idea that somehow, um, you know, we're spoiling, when we're trying to literally increase democracy. And that brings us, of course, to this idea that Yang has been really good about pushing, you know, and I welcome the forward party because they're different than us. We're not gonna be competing against the forward party, uh, guys, we're not. You know, I mean, they're gonna be a center-right party. They are not gonna be on our issues, but it's gonna be good to have another party in the mix. And, you know, one of the things that he talks about and something we talk about, right? Some of the Greens have been really pushing hard for for a long time is ranked choice voting, is proportional representation, right? Is getting money out of politics, abolishing electoral college, a whole host of other things that can be done to strengthen, uh, expand, you know, make our democracy more inclusive. And for those who are uh, here in North Carolina and want to support those efforts, I'll give a, 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 a please get in touch with Better Ballot North Carolina. Uh, Better Ballot NC, uh, they are the organization that for the last couple of years have been working towards ranked choice voting here in North Carolina. And so that ultimately comes back to this idea of why are we doing this? Why are we running in a system that's meant for two parties? Well, the system's not going to change unless we force it. Unless we put pressure onto the system, unless we force it to change, it won't do so. If the Democrats and Republicans have it set up where why are 70 percent of the races unopposed? Because the system's set up that way. It's structured well. They're all getting what they want. The Democrats are getting their votes in blue areas. The Republicans are getting their votes in red areas. And what does that do for the rest of us? What does that do for the majority of American people? Let alone the consequences to the world because both parties are parties of war and Wall Street. So you have to put pressure. We have to put stress on it. We have to force it to change. We have to break it, you know? And so, uh, to summarize, and, and you know, as we're, we're beginning this new part of the campaign, uh, you know, fully getting into the campaign, the next, uh, uh, you know, the next 11 weeks, we're, you know, launching a new website, we're doing some other things, but one of them is, we, is you know, putting force, forth our, our logo, you know, our motto, which our slogan, which is reclaim, reimagine, and rebuild. And, and that's what we have to do because we can see the, the, hurt and suffering that's occurring now is only going to worsen 
And, you know, for those who are youngest, you know, when I was with the other day with my family and my 11 year old nephew, when he's my age, 38 years from now, what is going to be, I mean, the, 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 the exiden- existential collapse that we're concerned about will be happening then. And that will be occurring when he's my age. And can we, how can we do that to them? You know, and it's finally, you know, I'll say this, this idea about hope. Hope is believing that something better is going to happen, that something outside of our control is going to come in and fix it. And that's not the case here, folks. We're not doing this because of hope. We're doing this because there's no alternative, because we have to do it. This is something that we must do. We will do. Hope is, hope is not available to us at this point, not any longer. So, you know, just to close it out with, uh, you know, the idea that we can just continue to think that things are going to get better. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. I know I'm pre- I mean, I know my audience here is, but just to, to reinforce this idea that we have to reclaim it, reimagine it, and rebuild it. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. So I'm so glad everyone is here. Hold on one moment. And I am going to take a moment here uh, before I hand it over to Matt for some closing statements. I just want to talk to y'all for a moment. Ah, I'm on spotlight. I don't like spotlight, but I, sometimes I got to do it. So I think you all know how important this campaign is and that we need a true fighter for the people. The Democratic Party was scared of Matt Ho. They were scared to compete. Now, I mean, just one thing in terms of this whole spoiler narrative and how this goes, just to add to that. Do you believe that if the Democratic Party intended to compete with Matt on the progressive, pro-environment, pro-people, pro-humanity programs that he will advance as the senator from North Carolina, do you think that if they could do that, that, that they would work this hard, that they would have done what they did to try to keep him and the North Carolina Green Party off the ballot, it's because they can't compete with that. It's because they're not offering any of that and they won't be offering any of that. And they will throw some crumbs and hope that you'll be humbly grateful for the crumbs that are being thrown. So we need to put a fighter for the people in the US Senate. And to that end, we need the fundraising to do it because we're going up against two parties that have multi-million dollar corporate donors. And that is who they're beholden to. Do you think that all this corporate money that goes to the Democrats and the Republicans, that at the end of the day, they're thinking of the people who vote them in and out of office, (laughs) that these are the people they're beholden to? No. The people who control those two parties, those are corporations. So it's people like you who are the people that Matt Ho is going to be beholden to. And to that end, I'm asking if there's any heroes here tonight who can do the maximum. The maximum is $2,900 that an individual can give. And I know that's a lot to ask, but Again, the, these two parties, uh, they have millions and millions of dollars and they are not looking out for the people. And it is through people who are in a position to do this and can do it, that we are going to be able to put Matt Ho in the US Senate, that we are going to fight to be in the debates And you got to know if we can get Matt in the debates, he's going to win this race. You do know that, right? Because when people see Matt going up against Ted Budd and Sherry Beasley, they're going to know who's on their side. So I'm asking for the maximum. And if anyone here can do it, 
You know, I, I keep leaving the donate link. I'm going to leave it again, but please do what you can. Okay. I don't want to keep people here all night. Sometimes I go longer, but I, you know, pause longer, but uh, $2,500. Is there anyone here who could do $2,500? Again, I know I'm asking a lot. I am, as I like to say, I am holding out for a hero. And, and really all of you are my heroes. Everyone who's trying to change this disease system, trying to create a better future for our children and grandchildren is a hero to me. So I want people to know that. It's, but if people, if there's anyone here positioned to really step up and help get this campaign on the map with the money we need to do things like advertise, put out billboards, travel Matt around so that he, we can get him to as many places as possible. So 2000, if anyone here could be the hero who could do 2000 for this campaign. And let me start leaving the link again while we sit on this for a moment. And, you know, one of the things, you know, um, <clears throat> we've got 7.3 million registered voters in North Carolina. In order to reach them, we need to be on television. We need to be on YouTube ads, uh, Facebook ads, uh, Twitter, uh, you know, as well as having billboards outside of NC State football games and Carolina Panther games and things like that. We've got to introduce people to who we are, you know, because one of the things we found as we were petitioning is that most people don't know what the Green Party is. It's a new party here in North Carolina. We're, it's being built, you know. Folks have been doing a great job building it the last few years, and now here we are at this point, and we've got people on the ballot, myself, Michael Trudeau, uh, Josh Bradley, you know, and we need help getting that message out and so as this last couple of months we were really held back by fighting the state of north carolina by fighting uh the democratic senatorial campaign court by being in both federal and in uh, state court by being in district court and in appeals court you know um we have really used up a lot of our resources but also now we've got that enthusiasm that excitement to go forward and do this and we need the help to make sure that people know we are an option so how do we get in front of 7.3 million registered voters with the resources we have? Uh, we need your help. And I will say, I did see a, a question about the debates. We are doing our best to get into the debates. As most folks know, they don't want third parties in the debates. Whether there'll actually be a debate but, uh, is another question because both Beasley and Bud are very, um, they don't like to appeal in public appear in public. And that's something that's going to set us apart because we are uh, putting together our schedule for where we're going to be the next couple of months. Uh, just as a heads up, we're going to be in Asheville uh, next Saturday, next, next Friday to Sunday. And then we'll be in the Charlotte Labor Day parade on the fifth, you know, and we'll be at events kind of every week. And we're going to post that and let people know. So people can come out and support us. People can come out and talk to us. We can listen to folks. And that really sets us apart from the Beasley and Bud's campaigns, which do almost nothing publicly, uh, you know, because that's that's what they are. They're 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 corporate shields, shields, you know, and we are trying to represent uh, the people who we love. Uh, so, but yeah, I mean, your support is what we need. So, if, if folks are able to donate, please do, and then by extension, encourage others to do so. Yes, then I'm going to fifteen hundred dollars. If anyone here could give $1,500. As for the person who asked about PayPal, uh, just so you know, there are FEC reporting reasons that PayPal does not work for uh, campaigns. It's, so that's why we can't use PayPal. Uh, you know, one of the ways that they make campaigning difficult is that there's specific ways you, you have to be able to record information about uh, the payment that, that PayPal makes too difficult to pass FEC requirements. And that's why we don't have it. But um, if anyone here could do $1,000, that would make a massive difference in what we could do. If I had, if I had three people here tonight 
do a thousand dollars. Andy, uh, please be in touch about volunteering because uh, I see Andy Cagle says I don't have money, but I I want to help. And yes, absolutely, we we want uh, to bring in volunteers and. Trust me when I say what I've been able to give in politics has not been money. It's been my time, it's been my labor, it's been my sweat and blood and tears. And so I understand that and um, all of it counts. So can anybody here do $500? Is there anyone here tonight who can do $500 to get Matt in the Senate? We need the money to make this campaign work. I mean, I will tell you something from when we were working uh, on the ballot access stage of this, we, it was through fundraisers like this that it was able to happen because the sheer amount of signatures we needed, we had a very passionate, uh petition uh you know our petitioners were a passionate group of greens and uh people who were excited about the campaign but they could not do the kind of hours that were necessary for this without getting a living wage and uh, any campaign that's going to be in favor of labor and the rights of labor can't be turning its back on the people who are putting in the hard labor for that. So at this point, I am gonna go, you know, cause I wanted to turn it over to Matt soon. I am going to go to, can, can people give $100 tonight? Are there, oh, somebody says they recently did uh, $500. Thank you, thank you, Sam Coleman. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Sam, for, for that and everything. Yeah, thank you. So if anyone here, okay, Mel, uh, Melody is going to be able to do 50. Ray is doing 100. Dave Mullenix is doing 100. Shout out. Shout right. out to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Stephanie, Stephanie thank you. Stephanie is doing 100. Nadia is doing 100. All right. Thank you. Yes. Everyone here who could do 100 could do 50. And if you are in a position to do 25, to do 10, these add up. We are a people powered campaign. You want to hear something really annoying? I find it very annoying. As soon as Sherry Beasley realized that she wasn't going to be able, you know, the Democratic Party wasn't going to succeed in knocking Matt off the ballot and that the Green Party was going to be on the ballot and Matt was going to be the Senate candidate for the North Carolina Green Party. She started calling herself the People Powered Campaign. <laughs> really? People like Chuck Schumer and Mark Elias. Well, yeah, that's that's not. Yeah, no, she did. She <laughs> she uh, she she talks now in her tweets and stuff about taking on corporations. And um, yeah, I mean, before we were on the ballot, she was pushing a very much a very uh, tough on crime kind of line. And I'm a moderate and, you know, I'm not, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And since we've been on the ballot, we've seen a change in her messaging. It's not been right dramatic but it's there it's there you'll look and see that that difference because she can't take the left for granted she can't take working families and the middle class for granted anymore which is what they want and which is what we're trying to disrupt and change and rectify Fahim thank you so much for that hundred while the pooches were woofing huh yeah sorry <laughs> about that <laughs> Oh, I, I I love Matt's dogs. I've never met them, but they're super cool dogs. All right. So, yes, um, keep in mind that, look, I need to ask for the maximum because if one or two people can do that, that pays for so much stuff in just, you know, just from one or two people. And we have had people do that. And we're so very grateful. But 
That doesn't mean that if you're, again, if you could do 10, if you could do 20, if you could do 50, if these are things that, that are much more closer to the amount of money you have and what you can do, then please do, please donate. Uh, thank you so much uh, for everything. Uh, you know, this campaign would be nowhere if it weren't for the people. As much as I love and respect Matt, and I do, uh, it is the people who put this campaign on the ballot, and it's the people of North Carolina who are going to put a true champion for the people in the U.S. Senate. And with that said, I am going to hand it back to Matt, and thank you all for being here, and uh, Matt, some closing remarks. Yeah, and, and thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, you know, thank you all so much. You, you've gotten us here and you're going to carry us forward. And I, I couldn't be more grateful. Uh, thank you, everyone who has donated tonight, donated in the past. We'll do in the future to all our volunteers and like everybody on this team. You know, I, I see Janie working in the comments, Dave Schwab. Uh, you know, I think I, I, I think I saw stars here tonight. Uh, you know, just all the different folks, Jackie Nabel, who put in so much time just out there daily getting signatures for us and still working with the campaign and everything. All these folks who have, have really built this campaign to what it is and so i'm so grateful uh coming up i just want to make sure people know i mentioned it just before briefly but you know we'll be in Asheville, north carolina at the goombe festival uh september 2nd to 4th that's a friday to, to sunday uh please come out and see us please come visit with us there if you'd like to volunteer and work the booth with us that'd be fantastic and then on september 5th on labor day uh, that Monday in Charlotte, we'll be marching in the Charlotte Labor Day Parade. So please, if you're available, if you're near Charlotte, you want to come march with us, please do so. We'll give you a banner to hold or signs or buttons to pass out or whatever, you know, but please, please join us. And then we'll be posting these events and asking for people not just to so, show up and say hi, but, you know, come and join us and, and help represent what we're, what we're trying to do here. We're trying to accomplish, be a part of it with us, you know, and I know some of you, it's a little hard. Uh, particularly Nicolanda out in Hawaii, maybe out in Maui in Haiku. But, uh, you know, for others who are closer, you know, if you can, that would be fantastic to be with you all in person. But, you know, thank you again uh, for everything, for getting us here. We'll be doing more of these webinars. Uh, sometimes it'll just be my, me running my mouth. Other times we'll have somebody that you probably want to listen to. But uh, I appreciate everything. Well, people like listening to you do that. <laughs> That's why 70 people showed up tonight to listen to you. Well, I thank you. But anyway, thank you all for, for being with us tonight and everyone have a good night. And uh, yeah, you know, like I said, the, the, our, our, our motto, uh, reclaim, reimagine, rebuild, and, and let's do that together. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. Uh, I truly appreciate everyone being here. And uh, these webinars and fireside chats are going to be a much more regular thing. So watch our social media page. Holly, um, share our social media page with everyone you know. Let's get <laughs> more people on it. Because so, I saw Holly uh, Hart, a friend of mine, uh, said that she was going to look into social media. So yes, do that, please. And thank you so much. And all of you have a great night. Bye. Give yourselves a hand. Bye-bye.